Hello everybody and welcome back to another show here at the Damage Report. Today is going to be fantastic, although not a Monday. Welcome to Fantastic Tuesdays. Hi, With John. There's so many issues going on right now. Hey, Francesca, <laughs> how's it going? I'm like getting stuff in my ear from a bunch of different windows, but we're gonna work through. I'm gonna try to focus on this window, the one that has you in it. Happy it belated doing? birthday, John, I'm good. Hey, that's very nice of you, thank you. I sent you something, did you get it? What did you send me? I'm just, did you get it or what? Is it at the studio? Is it digital? No, How did you send this? No. Is it at my house? I sent it to your house, which is at 555. 555th Street. Wait a second. Okay, was it? I don't know. I don't know if You're I did. So, what a jerk, you guys. I often <laughs> I'm don't try to be a jerk. <laughs> I don't know what I did wrong. Okay, just knock on all your neighbors' doors and ask them. <laughs> okay, well, after the show, we'll talk and we'll figure it out. Because my mom <laughs> sent me like six boxes of Pop Tarts, so I'm I, I don't know what. But we will talk and we will figure it out. I Hopefully would we'll never that feed out. your habit like that, John. No problem. Thank you. Every other person has. Jenk sent me this like 10 year anniversary box of Pop Tarts with a custom quote. It was very nice of him. <laughs> I have so many Pop Tarts. But so we're gonna figure that out. We're also gonna figure out why my preview display is like delayed by like an additional three seconds over what it usually is. Technology is the worst. <sighs> we're living in a gigantic NFT. That's basically what it is, I think. But anyway, no, I don't think it will. Um, but thank you for being here. We're gonna talk about some news, everyone. Thank you all for being out there. I am assuming you're out there. I will eventually be able to see your comments and everything. But thank you for being with us. Over the next 90 minutes or so, we're gonna talk about so much news. Mask mandates and the dropping of said, the SCOTUS weighing in on racist gerrymandering maps. We've got cheese and or heroin, basically take your pick. <laughs> uh, Leslie Jones goes toe to toe with the mainstream media. And news from around the world in Meanwhile In. By the way, where are you broadcasting from? I just realized you're back on your um your, your heaven slash purgatory background. Where are mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. I I am in heaven. Yeah. I've oh. I've after uh you did not receive my gift, I died. You died. And here I am looking I down. I cannot miss now it's Tuesday in the afterlife we do Tuesdays on the damage report. No, <laughs> I'm at my mom's house, uh, which is at 555 uh, 55th. Oh, jeez. 555. Well, wherever you happen to be, we like, you know where <laughs> you all should be? You all should be in the frame of mind where you're hitting the like button. That would be great so that people know we're live. If you're on a platform that has a like button, of course. Uh, but with that, in just one moment, we're gonna jump into some news. Let's see if we can do this. <clears throat> A bunch of states are in the process or on the precipice of dropping their mask mandates. Particularly, we're gonna be talking about for schools because some schools in some states did apparently at, at the end of the day have mask mandates for like a little bit. Yes, we are. We are very much in the middle of that wave. But regardless, some states are making this change. We have four different states. Oregon is the most recent to announce that it is gonna be removing its statewide mask mandate for schools. We found out yesterday, by the way, that New Jersey, Connecticut, and Delaware were going to do this. Some of these states, by the way, were hit really, really hard during this wave that we're still in the middle of. Um, anyway, uh, the loosening guidelines are signs that the four states are changing how they manage the COVID-19 pandemic as cases uh, continue subs to subside. We'll, we'll show you how much subsidence been going on in a little bit. Uh, Ned Lamont, governor of Connecticut recommended Monday that the state end their mandate on February 28th. That is the earliest date. So simply because they're announcing it doesn't mean that it's already gone, but it will be ending um, during this school term, I guess. Why you wouldn't just wait a couple more months and ride out the end of the semester, I don't know. But I'm not the governor of a state. Delaware, their indoor mask mandate for public and private K-12 schools and child care facilities will end on March 31st. So about a month after Connecticut, the universal indoor mask mandate expires Friday. And the governor, John Carney of Delaware, had this to say about the policy change. I want to be clear about this point. COVID is still circulating in our communities. And the virus still poses a risk of serious illness, particularly among those who are not up to date on their vaccinations. But we have the tools to keep ourselves and each other safe. 
Now let me throw out this tool to keep ourselves and each other safe. <laughs> so also masks are banned now. We have tools, don't worry. Anyway, Francesca, what do you make of it? I honestly cannot wrap my head around how and why the simplest way to stop the spread of a virus that continues to kill 2500 people every single day still is being just tossed out. Like we don't even have to talk about the vaccine. You just put a mask over your stupid face. Just put it over, it will stop the spread, it will help. We don't even have to do the whole Bill Gates run around microchip Fauci ouchy crap, right? And yet even that, and it's mm. it just seems like such, again, talking about this as if it were a war, as if it were any kind of national mobilization, we have failed and time and again, we throw in the towel. And honestly, I can't even think of an economic benefit for why you would get rid of a mask mandate, right? The whole thing is about let, let's feed our souls to the market gods, you know, like I get it. <laughs> you know, like between Trump and Biden, sadly, there's been not enough of a difference between the whole get back to work push. What's the difference? What's the difference if you're wearing a mask or not? If anything, you're keeping your customers and your workers safer. Mm -hmm. People still can come into your business. What are we doing here? Well, I think uh Look, I think I think it's complex and might vary by state. And I look, I don't know the specific, you know, public health culture of Delaware individually or Connecticut or whatever. But um, let's say that hypothetically you could do what you said and just require it, keep your customers safe. Uh, that would probably be appreciated by the two thirds of Americans that support mask mandates and are perfectly happy to have them continue. But what if they're cool about it? But the other 10 to 30 percent will make a big stink literally constantly. What if they will make your life a living hell, the lives of your employees a living hell? And what if the war thing that you were talking about, what if there's also a war on, I don't know, like the governors of these states? So what if they're like, this has been made into a war. These people did not want to be a part of the public health side of this. But they do very much love engaging in the culture war side of this. And so again, I don't know in these particular cases how much pressure they're feeling from anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers, anti-mandate people, truckers or whatever. Um, but we do know it's out there. I guess I'm just like really disappointed in this country. It's very funny to me to watch the Canadian truckers because they've actually had a minimal amount of lockdown three years in. You know, and you hear them and they're like, you know, some people, there's tons of Trumpers and QAnon folks, and it's being led by some really, really um, distasteful and like crazy conspiracy theorists. But at the other, you know, it's it's attracting some Canadians because they're like, yeah, you know, I just want to go to school and I want to go out to eat and I want to, and you're like, yeah, welcome to the United States. We've been able to do that. We're all murderers. We've been murdering one another for a long time. Really proud of being murderers here. Um, all our like restrictions on freedom, that's just in our head. It's all up here for us, which is great, you know, uh, easier to manipulate when it's all going on upstairs. But like again, the one thing that stands strong, the one thing that's borne out, you were an anti-masker in 2020. By 2022, you should be completely pro mask, right? But you're not, right? If you're if you're like, well, the vaccine didn't work because of these breakthrough cases. If you believe that, obviously that's not true. Um, but let's say you did. The one thing that stands strong is the freaking mask. Yeah, yeah. Assuming you wear it right and you wear the right one and everything. But no, they don't. Like one of the most frustrating things about this is that they will say, here is the reason why I'm against doing X, whether it's a mask or a vaccine or social distancing or whatever. But very frequently, they're just, they're fundamentally not being honest about the reasons. Yeah. They will say they're worried about side effects. Okay, it's it's been more than a year. They, that wasn't actually, I, I, you know, I'm just waiting for it to get, you know, full FDA authorization. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're lying to me when you say that. That's not why you're against this. Yeah. And yeah, we have really the worst of both worlds. We, haven't had a lockdown, we basically never have. And yet, so we get the deaths and the continued spread of disease and all that. 
And at the same time, we have a right saying that they're living in the middle of like the Holocaust or something. And they're literally saying that over and over, pretending that a lockdown that does not exist and never has existed exists right now. So we get the disease and we get this needless culture war or needless from our point of view. It's certainly there's a reason for it from their point of view. With that said, I wanna move on to another aspect of this. Let's jump directly into this video of Jen Psaki. Got announcements that in Delaware and New Jersey, uh, the governors are going to be ending mask mandates coming up pretty soon. Um, what is the White House view on these kinds of announcements, given that in Virginia, Governor Youngkin faced a lot of pushback from Democrats for making similar changes to the mask policy? Well, they, they weren't actually that similar because what happened here in New Jersey and uh, and a couple of other states you mentioned is that uh, they pulled back the requirement. They didn't make it more difficult for schools, school administrators, local officials to keep requirements that they made a determination would keep their schools safe. Okay, so look, I, Francesca, I believe that you can still criticize what they're doing and especially the timing of, of what they're doing. But I do think, as much as I'm not like a Jen Psaki stan or whatever, uh, yeah, that there is a there is a big difference between ending the requirement and banning it from happening, effectively taking away the autonomy of school districts, uh, you know, or counties to do this is very different than not requiring them to do it. But both measures do share the similarity that they're going to reduce the amount of compliance that you have. It has the same impact. I mean, it's just whether you're politicizing it or not. But either way, you are comp- you are capitulating to an anti-science, um, far-right agenda and a corporate agenda. Let's be real. This is about subjecting workers to getting sick. This is about subjecting everyday people who have to who can't work from home, especially, right? So we're talking about working class people. We're talking about more blue collar folks. Talking about people who work in close quarters with one another who don't have a choice. And I know that yes, there are some um, continued vaccine and testing requirements. Thank God the, the Supreme Court didn't completely strike that down when it came to those mandates for businesses. But still, we know who has been traditionally been targeted. Y'all, this hasn't changed, right? Like. As much as yes, a lot of anti-vaxxers who generally have been more far to the right, listen to podcasts like Joe Rogan. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that so early in the show. Um, you know, and 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 maybe they are, you know, now uh uh like more middle class, maybe they're more white. This has fallen on the backs of people of color and working people. Like disproportionately, the people who are working in fields, people who are working in kitchens, people who are working in all kinds of places, and who honestly do generally do the work to support this country's economy as a whole, who we've long ignored. So, like, yeah. again, it is a war on working people. And honestly, California in a week is going to drop our own mass mandates. But Gavin Newsom still thinks he's some sort of like stalwart against, you know, the far right, and he believes in science. The effect, the impact is the same. People will still continue to die, to get sick. At least wait until March, April. I don't know, we've seen this, we're two years in y'all. Like we know when this is probably going to get better. But even then I think, and this is the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry. But you talked to public health officials about what went wrong, right? The last two years, what have we gotten wrong? Well, the main thing they come away with, and I'm not talking about people within the CDC, I'm talking about folks outside of it is, that the messaging has been back and forth, the ping ponging of the messaging, not with the understanding of the virus, but with things like, well, once you get vaccinated, you don't need a mask. That was like a complete strike against the Biden administration that did not help with people understanding how to stop the spread. Why not continue the mask mandate when you're indoors? Again, there is no harm in doing that. But instead, people were given different, two different conflicting messages and and look, we've got a new variant. So anyway, I, that is the last thing I'll say, but I just wish there was solid messaging coming out of anyone. Yeah, yeah. it, it generally feels like the Biden administration threw us uh, some tests, they threw us some masks and now you're on your own. And, and plenty of people will take it seriously. Like uh, as we talked about yesterday in the show, when they say America's moving on, the pandemic's over. No, the people who moved on a year and a half ago are moving on or 
That's what yeah. they're doing. They're just more <laughs> moving on. Plenty of people are still being responsible. I just feel like it's the same people. I feel like you know, uh, you have five, six, seven hundred thousand more deaths hasn't really moved the needle for any new people taking it seriously. Um, Evangeline Lilly isn't more pro mandate than she was at the beginning. I don't think that's happening. But anyway, um, here's the situation. We're gonna just uh, our favorite chart that we ever show. Here is uh, the most recent information on this wave. The case count over the last two weeks, the daily average of the past two weeks has dropped by 62%, which means it's only still higher than ever before this wave. And it'll continue to go down, I'm sure. And that means that over the next week or two, hospitalizations, which are already trending down, will go down more. Deaths are still trending up, they will start to go down. And everyone who has taken this seriously can just cross their fingers and hope that that was the last wave. Why would it be the last wave? Beats me, I have no idea why another one wouldn't be coming. But hey, maybe this time it'll come up us. Anyway, with that said, we're gonna go to our first break. When we come back, the SCOTUS has made a decision and get used to for the next couple of decades that not necessarily being a great thing. Oh, we do have a poll by the way. So do we, I, I don't see it in the doc. Okay, so I believe it is about, Oh, there we go, thank you. So in terms of the school mask mandates ending, what do you think about this? It's happening in a bunch of different places. Do you think it should? So you can go to tyt.com slash polls and answer no masks should still be required for all. This is specifically in schools, everyone. Or yes, mask mandates should be lifted if cases continue to fall. Such a ridiculous, and that's the framing by the way that they will use. But maybe that's why they're falling. Anyway, we live in a crazy world. It's not the one that I've chosen, but this is the one we were born into. So with that, we're <laughs> gonna take a short break. We come back, more news after this. Oh, this next story, oh God, okay, let's, let's get used to it. Turns out the Supreme Court matters. Who could have guessed it? Nobody did. Anyway, let's jump into this. The SCOTUS, which don't forget, has a conservative supermajority, which means that they can produce decisions like the one we're about to discuss. They have decided that Alabama can continue to use in this upcoming election a gerrymandered congressional map that, what do you know, minimizes the electoral power of black voters in Alabama. So understand that Alabama has seven congressional districts, okay? Not a lot, but seven. Its voting age population is about 27% black. In the map that the SCOTUS is allowing to continue to be used, black voters are in a majority in one district of the seven. And I'm not great at math, I'm not an expert at fractions or anything, but that's underrepresented, which is exactly what we would expect. So anyway, they have blocked the creation of what could have been a second majority black congressional district in Alabama for the 2022 election. This is one of the decisions of their so-called shadow docket, which is effectively they use an emergency order that weighs in on something that has to be decided right now. And conveniently, that means that we don't have to have oral arguments. We don't have to really defend this, it just happens super fast. And so that's gonna happen. Uh, this is the the SCOTUS weighing in it, with the shadow docket is the result of a three judge federal court panel uh, uh, at the appeals level uh, challenging this that might have required the creation of a second majority black district. Uh, but Francesca, that as of now is not going to happen. It might happen before the next election after this one, but not now. A second black district in Alabama. So this means there's only one? Yep, there's one. This is the site of Bloody Sunday. This is the Selma to Montgomery March. This is, this is where Martin Luther King and so many other civil rights leaders put their bodies on the line. This is where we saw them um, brutalized and, and killed, however many uh, dozens. And now, uh, less than a hundred years later, goodbye. Good, we're done. I mean, honestly, I think that the Supreme Court thinks that once there's like a biopic about something, that immediately means the thing no longer matters. They're <laughs> like, oh, they've got representation in Hollywood. That means we can take it away at the ballot box. I mean, mm -hmm. it is 
it's so gross and the saddest part about it to me is that and I haven't been on since Biden said this, John, so we haven't had a moment to sort of hash it out. That Biden's best friends with Mitch McConnell, that Biden mm-hmm. is just homies with him, that he just likes him and he's a good guy and he's an honorable man. And all these honorable men that we just need to meet halfway who are honorably stripping the voting rights of black Americans throughout this nation. And especially in the South where legacies of Jim Crow and slavery and everything else have led to the laws that we currently have on the books. But no, 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 gut those laws and um, all these honorable men doing the honorable thing. What the hell? I mean, at yeah. least at least with Bernie Sanders, you go down fighting. And I'm, I don't mean to relitigate, I feel like I'm relitigating every time I'm on recently. But I'd rather go down fighting than go down saying that someone is an honorable man. My God, Mm -hmm. the Democrats, I swear to God. He loves that broken down old crow. He just loves that old crow in the words of Donald Trump. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and uh, so uh, look, again, this decision is not really surprising anyone, I guess, and it shouldn't. And it, you know, you're gonna have a lot of time to get used to it if it does, because we ain't flipping the Supreme Court anytime soon. Um, but yes, they can do this. At least though, while the map based on this gerrymander will be racist, at least that's the only thing that is uh, stopping people in Alabama from exercising their full democratic rights. No, I'm kidding. Um, I recently rewatched um, Infinity War and Endgame. And there's this scene where uh, Doctor Strange wraps Thanos in a whole bunch of glowing Lassos. Why mm-hmm. does he do that? Well, because he has to. One isn't enough. But like that's what they're doing here. It's like they've designed the districts to minimize the power of black voters. But also those black voters are gonna find it harder in a million different ways to register, to actually get out there, to have their vote be counted. There are gonna be all sorts of obstacles thrown up to make it as easy as possible to disqualify their votes in a bunch of different ways. Even if somehow they overcome all of those lassos. There's still the structural inequality of the Senate, which is going to magnify the power of rural white conservative voters. Yep. And even if they take it over, the Supreme Court can override any law that might be passed by some sort of actual progressive uh, Congress anytime soon. There's just so many layers of it. Yeah, I don't know what all that nerd stuff you just said was, um, but I just wanted to bring up the point that <laughs> it's your birthday, you can have it. Uh, mm-hmm. You know. It's so insidious when you when you also stop to think about um, the ways that redlining have also contributed to you know disproportionately underrepresented districts, uh, Black Americans unable to buy housing, get loans, uh, move out of the neighborhoods uh, that of of course are uh, perhaps the most toxic, perhaps the most in in um, food deserts that uh, all all kinds of things you know perhaps the most crime all of those different aspects and the ways that this country systemically keeps mm-hmm. um, black and brown people ghettoized for lack of a better term and then it, even if those folks are moving into let's say middle class, upper middle class neighborhoods. No, 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 we will draw district lines around you so that your voting power, your mm. school district, your taxes, they still remain. Like they are, you can never, and essentially it's enforced segregation continuing into the year 2022, right? It is, it's like, oh no, no matter what inroads that you make, we will continue to roll those back politically, um, economically. This is what we're talking about when we talk about mm-hmm. systemic racism. I mean, like, yep. well, yeah. well, you and know, like, well, anyway, the right misunderstands racism so hard and on purpose because they've orchestrated it. They're behind it, they create it. Yeah, yeah, well, and let, let's of course identify that it is a combination of stupidity and lying. Yeah, they do actually have plenty of misunderstandings. They're incredibly willfully ignorant people, but they're also lying constantly. Yeah. We're actually gonna turn to that because I wanna identify the two types of people that you should be angry about in this at the very least. So one is someone like Mo Brooks, congressman from Alabama mm-hmm. who says, uh, you know, I was gonna do, I was gonna do a mocking impersonation, but I don't know for sure how he sounds. So I'm just gonna read it. Uh, These liberal activist judges have tried to segregate us based on race. I find that abominable in order to elect people in certain parts of the state based on race, which I also think is abominable. We've got to put the skin pigmentation issue behind us. 
the concept that blacks can only be elected in black districts and whites should have districts of their own in which they get elected. I believe that is racist and I oppose it. I don't like racism. I just want to make sure that black voters never count for anything ever, ever, ever in this state. So look, he's obviously awful and there's an entire party of Mo Brooks's. Um, but let's also bear in mind, you know, when when you get told just how to organize it. Just out organize yes. it. Uh, no, screw you. They like the people in Alabama, people in states across the country, young people, all sorts of people out organized a whole bunch of different things <laughs> in 2020. And like the, I guess the reward they got, the prize they got was some more weights being put onto their shoulders. Yes. Oh, you didn't think that the vote was suppressed enough before? Now it's just gonna be even worse uh, in a number of different ways. And by the way, we could have like this this issue at the Supreme Court might have been fixed if they had passed some sort of voting bill, but they're not doing that because again, that's another one of those obstacles. That's another golden lasso around Thanos's arm. Is there's always going to be a mansion and there's always going to be a cinema and hell if they you know if they left then maybe Tester would stand up. There are so many obstacles. Doesn't mean you don't keep fighting. Because you know, like pointless, a non-political apathy, or you know, just uh, you know, like jeering at the people trying to actually fix things from the sideline, isn't going to fix anything, and it's not designed to. Uh, but it is unfortunate that we we have so many constant obstacles in our way. Any other yep. No, last thought is you can't call Kirsten Cinema smart as the devil. I'm sorry. You can't do that. You just talked about people on the grassroots fighting, giving you the biggest turnout in an, in an election in history. Yeah. Flipping the Senate seats in Georgia and you turn around and congratulate the people who are stymieing your agenda, i.e. the agenda of democracy so that people can vote legally and freely. And you turn around and call those people smart. You call those people your friends. How do you expect anyone to come out and vote for you again? They're doing, first of all, no one voted for you. No one's voting for Biden. They're voting so the boot will come off their neck. They're voting mm -hmm. against fascism. But my God, if we don't take the action when we're actually in power, it's, yep. it's getting ever so hard to make the case time and time again that these fools have any idea what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we will still try to. Because somebody might say, well, then what's the difference? It should have just been Trump. Okay, if you, again, as I always say, I'll say this again. If you would like to make the affirmative case for why fascism is better for progressives, feel free to do that. You don't seem eager to. You keep trying to imply it, the implication. But we are going to. Well, keep John, this is People a step like change. once the Supreme Court is um, nothing but like the horsemen of the apocalypse, <laughs> then. Then. The left will rise up though, because yeah. we'll be, it's like we'll be so powerless, we'll have power. Yeah. What if, what if that strategy wasn't actually about accomplishing change? What if it was about making a bunch of money? <laughs> what if that strategy is one of the golden lassos? What if that's one of the things making it harder for the progressives? What if that's by design? What if the right knows that and loves it? <laughs> now we're getting to some JR experience. Here we go. Anyway, <laughs> with that said, no, we have more bad news for you. Actually, not just that. Let's transition to our next topic. <clears throat> I've got some good news and some bad news for you on a progressive priority, or at least like sort of a scaled down, shriveled up version of a progressive priority. And that is free public community college. Okay, only two years of it, but good news, bad news. The good news is, did you know they were still working on that? The bad news is they're not anymore. So yay, Jill Biden, who was apparently shepherding this over the last year or so. News for me, I guess I should have been paying more attention. Just recently said, one year ago, I told this group that Joe, my husband Joe was going to fight for community colleges. But Joe has also had to make compromises. Congress hasn't passed the Build Back Better legislation yet. And free community college is no longer a part of that package. We knew this wouldn't be easy. Still, like you, I was disappointed. Because like you, these aren't just bills or budgets to me, to you, right? We know what they mean for real people, for our students. 
are screwed, screwed students. She then says it was a real lesson in human nature that some people just don't get that. So uh, yeah, no, they, oh. they had been working on it. Uh, the bill uh, would have originally committed $45.5 billion to waive two years of tuition at community colleges uh, for five years. States would have to opt in, federal government would cover the cost of the program for the first year. And then the federal contribution would decrease 5% each year after that. So that is $45.5 billion to fund two years of college for five years, which works out to less than $10 billion in funding per year, which is like what? What percentage of our military budget is that? Yeah. <laughs> nope, sorry. It's a real lesson in human nature though, Francesca. And isn't that at the end of the day more important than college? It's amazing like that we're upset about the crumb not passing, but like the crumb, just the little bitty crumb. I feel like a small mouse <laughs> just sort of sidling up to a small crumb and very excitedly like, okay, this is not as big of a crumb as I want it, but pretty good. And then just, a gust of wind blows and it's <laughs> gone and somehow I'm sad, but I didn't even want the crumb because it wasn't really gonna fill me in the first place. Anyway, I'm feeling weird, but the yeah. <laughs> the, re the reality is, is it's not only bad enough that this, that here's what I'll say. It's very clear that the reason that tuition free community college, at least for two years, for only five, two years, for five years in total, Right, as you said, a fraction of the military budget, annual military budget. It's so clear why it failed because you hear uh, the tone of the person who was fighting for it, which is, man, I really learned a lot about human nature, says Jill Biden. Not, I am livid that the people, that the the decision makers behind this, that we couldn't get on board with something so basic, so something so simple and fundamental as the right to an education, the right to not be indebted to receive that education. I We are going to keep trying, we are going to keep pushing, this is unacceptable. That's the attitude, but no, if your concession was already man, ah, oh, I just, we just didn't see eye to eye, then clearly you never were fighting for it in the first place. Yeah, and look, look, Jill Biden is, I guess, the the impetus for this news. I don't know how mad we should be about her. I mean, you can read things like this. She spent her first year visiting community colleges, but did not campaign for the support of Democratic senators and House members who wanted to pare back or eliminate the provision outright. Well, okay, then that seems a little bit short sighted. But I don't know how mad should we be with her? Do we think that if she'd had lunch with Kirsten Cinema, then surely it would have passed? No, probably not. It probably had no chance whatsoever. Um, but I would say, like, I I do think that some of these senators are mostly out of phase with any sort of reality of consequences. Like you could try to hit them with attack ads, but it doesn't really matter if they have no intention of running again or if they'd be perfectly happy joining like the board of Walmart or something. But I don't know. I like traditions. Why not do it anyway? Like, do do are there ads being run in West Virginia? Like Hey, did you consider going to college and now you can't afford it? Well, you could have, but Joe Manchin didn't think it was worth it. Like, is he going to be hit by any of the the loss of what could have been? Is cinema? I mean, people hate cinema. I get that, but are all these ads being made? I like could Jill Biden have said something maybe? I know I know Joe can't. He has no power. He's only the president of the free world, but maybe the first lady could have said something, a speech where they identify the people that killed this almost single handedly. I don't know. Any I don't thoughts? even know what's left in the bill. Like, I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. It's been stripped for parts. I'm pretty sure the only thing that's left is Joe Manchin gets another like coal mine or something, or like he, he gets to drill like in the White House. I don't know like what's <laughs> left of this. I don't know. Well, how about this? Democrats are still exploring expanding tuition assistance for low and middle income students. What, what's the crumb of a crumb? It's, it, it was already almost no money. It was basically free. You know, I looked it up just out of curiosity. Uh, you all are familiar with the F-35. Lifetime cost of that program, $1.6 trillion. It would be like it would be the paint 
on the F-35. So the kids could at least go to two years of community college. Which by the way, is not impressive. That was not going to be this major win. We would still be the laughing stock of the advanced world. We're not getting that. Oh, it's bad. But they're considering tuition assistance. Yeah, how are they gonna pass it through the filibuster? You think Republicans are gonna, what, the Republicans are gonna support that? Is that gonna be the one thing they can do via reconciliation? Get out of here. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say is I, I found it very funny. I think. Vice President Harris a few weeks ago had a <laughs> tweet that was like, I am proud to announce that I will be relieving student debt for, and I was like, what, what, what? Mm-hmm. Pell Grant recipients who are more than $20,000 in debt, who began a small business in a black or brown underserved community and have at least three years in that business. And it was like, what the hell? Like this is the most qualified, like merit-based yeah. <laughs> piece of legislation that you're trying to trot out and be proud of. Ridiculous. All right, I've now I'm now ascending into heaven. So I'm I am go. worried. I think you're being absorbed. I am by I the am. afterlife. It's getting brighter and brighter. Are you hot? I'm just like a like, filter. Is it getting hot in there? John, you have no idea. Like, if I could tell you the work I've put in to making this not happen, yeah. you'd be like, that's sad. I'm look, I get that. I'm admitting my ignorance. I don't know what it's like to broadcast from the corona of the sun. No, I've never experienced it's very that. warm. Anyway. Jeez. Anyway. <laughs> By the way, like if you want to okay, hmm. If only we could make it affordable to do two years of community college. I don't know. How about like automatically canceling their debt as soon as they receive the debt? You could do that. You could do that. If you want, like, oh, we lost on this funding thing that would make higher education possible, you could cancel the debt to reassure us there are things you could do. There's apparently something I can and should do. Apparently, I should break. I'm being told very loudly in my documents. So uh, we're going to take our break. We come back, cheese, heroin, the combination of the two after this. Okay, everybody, uh, we've gone through a bunch of bad news. Uh, let's get to some weird news. And you know what? I'm, you don't know this is behind the scenes. I'm getting really hungry right now, and we're about to launch into our food block. So that's great. That's great news for me. But with that said, let's jump into this. Pretty much every bit of news about Eric Adams since he became the mayor of New York City has been kind of weird. Even like the corruption and nepotism has been like particularly weird. Well, it's about to get weirder. He recently equated heroin addiction to being hooked on cheese just this week. He said, according to this tweet from Chris Sommerfeld, that food is like a drug and claims people would not be able to tell the difference between someone hooked on heroin and someone hooked on cheese. He also acknowledges he does, quote, not have great self discipline. When it comes to food or metaphors, apparently he's got two weaknesses. Um, anyway, he is a self proclaimed vegan. He claims to have cured his own diabetes and even reverse blindness he was experiencing in one eye by switching to a plant based diet. Uh, so, anyway, he is pushing for uh, more New Yorkers to switch to plant based meals as possible. That seems a little bit inconsistent with the big worry about cheese. Wouldn't you maybe be eating more of it? I don't know. I mean, I just understand it's not vegan. I get that. But I don't think most New Yorkers are going to instantly switch to being vegan. And if they're vegetarian, they might eat more. Anyway, we'll see what happens. But anyway, he says food is addictive. You take someone on heroin, put them in one room, and someone hooked on cheese, put them in another room, which I've done. It's a great experiment. I have a, a level of my uh, manor house, which is specifically for this experiment. No, I'm kidding. You take it away. I challenge you to tell me the person who's hooked on heroin and who's hooked on cheese. Okay, Francesca, this is a very interesting way to convince people to go with his thing. So, uh, what do you think about this analogy? What, <laughs> buddy? Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Like, um. Don't say that. Hey, how about that? Hey, hey, psst, hey, new mayor. Hey, what up? Shh. <laughs> Don't say that about people who are addicted to heroin. I'm pretty sure you're gonna be able to tell the difference between the person addicted to heroin who's trying to get sober and going cold turkey and the person not eating cheese. Yeah. Uh, have you seen train spotting? There's a reason that's about heroin <laughs> and not cheese. 
Nobody mm -hmm. trying to go cold turkey off heroin ever saw like a baby crawling upside down on the ceiling. What the hell? And like, it's just, <laughs> it is so ridiculous to me that, it, and so perfectly on brand Eric Adams, which again, this is gonna be a very fun ride because it is gonna be nonstop foot in mouth stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But it is this like weird thing that I think some vegans not all have where they're like, you know, Actually, this is the most important issue ever that like cheese eating is way more important than let's say harm reduction around heroin use and allowing folks yeah. to get clean and supporting them. It's like, no, 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 we got to talk about the cheese. I, and well, I Francesca, get, no, continue. No, I'm just saying I get the climate change argument. I'm with you, y'all, you know, I'm a vegetarian, but like who sometimes eats chicken. Okay, don't at me, but like. <laughs> <laughs> it's basically a fish, so. The, yeah, I basically, look, I eat all the animals, but I'm a vegetarian. The point is this, no, it is not more important and it's so crass and so ham-fisted to make that comparison. John, what do you yeah. think? I, I, I think that I love the idea that you once saw tuna listed as chicken of the sea and thought, oh, so we can do that too? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, no, um, by the way, I will say that in my experience, um, the vast majority of the vegans I've met have been very understanding about cheese based heroin analogies and have mm. not freely thrown them about. Um, look, it is, it is obviously an incredibly important area. And I do think as many people converting to a vegan diet as possible is great as long as I'm not one of them. I'm kidding, I, I, I advocate for all non me people to do that. For a lot of reasons, I do think there's a lot of health benefits. I do think that there's environmental benefits. I think that there are a lot of benefits in a lot of different areas. And I think you can even advocate for that as a politician without whatever this was. Um, now I will say uh, to play devil's advocate, not to say that he's the devil, he's slightly better. Um, look, I do think that food addiction is real. And I think it's something that a lot of people do think about. Like something cannot be the most objectively important political issue, but it can be the thing that's digestible for a lot of people. A lot of people do think about food and what they eat and they do struggle with things. I legit believe that I have an addiction to sugar. It is very much not the same thing as a heroin addiction, but I do think that it's an addiction. So I think that taking that seriously and making that a part of your platform can be a good idea. I just think that you have to tread carefully. And I think that he has he has gone in a different direction, that's all. I'm sure he has an exception for cops. I mean, this is terrible and most people shouldn't eat this, but like cops, I mean, yeah, hey, more cops in subways, hey, when you're cracking skulls, you gotta eat those that cheese. Yeah, anyway, I just, this <laughs> this man is such a conundrum. He's so cringe, he's so cringe, he's so yeah. cringe. I, look, I agree, but I will say, and I, I see my producer is, okay, hold on. Okay, I'll read the graphic. I love that my producers start making things with the graphic bigger and bigger. Okay, back in 2015, a University of Michigan study was mistakenly cited in a wave of articles claiming cheese is as addictive as cocaine or cheese really is crack. It's not. According to the CDC, overdose deaths from opioids increased to over 75,000. In the 12 month period ending in April of last year, up from 56,000 the year before, the federal agency does not track deaths from eating too much cheese. But they could, I'm sure Eric Adams has a, a brother or a cousin he can put in charge of that, I suppose. And by the way, the producer says the controversy does not stop there. New York City Mayor Adams admits occasionally eating fish despite claiming to be vegan. Mm. Now understand, I am not a vegan, but. Get off of him over occasionally eating fish. Seriously, how pure do we expect people to be? <laughs> it's fish. It's basically a vegetable. You like if you want, it, you can still be vegan and occasionally break. It happens. This One is time not, I dropped a carrot in a pond and I was like, look, there's a fish. Swim away. <laughs> <laughs> it looks the same. Yeah, oh, I'm, who, just, this just is, get off it's, of people. It's so dumb. And like, it reminds me also of like Bloomberg's, you know, getting rid of uh, trans fats and big gulps. And it's like, look, I, I support that. I mean, this isn't even that. Mm -hmm. Like, this isn't even. No, this, as isn't, this isn't that. We, no. we do have to, yeah, we, we, we do have to move on. I, okay, I, let's move on. I, move I on. I honestly, like, like, just let, let get off of people, get off of him. 
but also also get off of vegans. A lot of people are like, they, there's nothing they love more than hating people who eat differently. And that does go to vegetarians and vegans too. I know some people can be too evangelical about it, but they also get a lot of attacks. Anyway, with that said, let's jump into our last story of the hour. <clears throat> Everybody's got opinions about the Joe Rogan thing. Certainly we have, well, what do you know? Donald Trump is not immune to that too. He recently put out this very helpful statement for Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is an interesting and popular guy, but he's gotta stop <laughs> apologizing to the fake news and radical left maniacs and lunatics. How many ways can you say you're sorry? I don't even know one. Joe, just go about what you do so well and don't let them make you look weak and frightened. That's not you and it never will be. We don't know what if any response to that Joe Rogan has. A spokesman for Rogan did not immediately respond to a request for comment early Tuesday. Again, I will remind you to all the people who think people just love Rogan because he's just like me. Do you have a spokesperson? You as like an individual person who hosts a podcast, do you have a spokesperson? Because he does. He does. Anyway, uh, Francesca, what do you make of uh, the advice? I mean, you actually disagree with it? Trying to get an interview, obviously. <laughs> you know, uh, Trump is so excited to use the N word in context. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever that means, it's in context. Um, no, it is interesting to me, I will say, and I've I've been trying to avoid the Rogan situation like the plague, honestly. When you and I talked about it two weeks ago on my podcast, I was like, this can't be continuing for another <laughs> week. And lo and behold, it has. But my real thing with him is I'm surprised that he even apologized. And I do believe that apology is coming because of Spotify, because he is in fact a corporate podcaster. He does in fact make hundreds of millions of dollars from Spotify. And yeah, they want to claim that they're doing all that they can and that they want to be above board now, of course. And so mm. they're making him apologize and he's doing a pretty bad job doing it. Um, I will say this, I don't think that even in legitimate circumstances, um, like I think this is a legitimate circumstance, but I think apologies on the internet never go well. They're very difficult people um, like myself, like. I already know what I think about Rogan and his apology. I already know it's not sincere. I don't need him to, I don't need to, I see his behavior. I see what he, his intention based on his own show. So I'm not really sure who this is for other than Spotify CEO to feel better about themselves. Yeah, look, yes, I, I, I might disagree a little bit. I, I think that I, Look, I, I always add these like caveats and trying to be understanding, and even though it'll never be accepted, like people will still yell at me and say that I'm trying to cancel when I'm literally not even asking for him to lose a show or whatever, and I'm trying to be understanding. I think he somewhat means that seeing that mashup might have actually surprised him. He might not have realized how many times he said it. That doesn't mean that that can be the that has to be the only reason. It could also be fears or whatever. But I do think Trump is weighing in on this in the same reason that every right winger that you've ever met has tweeted about this constantly while saying people shouldn't be talking about it. It's clout chasing. Trump is clout chasing off yep. of Rogan. I don't think he listens to his show. Maybe he'd go on it, but it's just they're trying to get Rogan. It's like Rumble offering the hundred million dollars to him. They want him on his on his side. I I I don't think it's that big of a leap. Anyway, with that said, we gotta take a short break. There's more coming though, so don't go anywhere.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.